track, it really means maybe I'm going to horse racing. Or if I say I'm going to the gym, I really mean I'm going to work out. Okay, so that's what this means. So when you back up and you say, I'll put, you'll be enemies between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now this breaks down, there's two groups of people that are enemies with each other. Now, let's go forward. It also tells you here, her seed, that there's going to be a birth that comes from a woman without a man involved. That's interesting. I know we know most of this because we've been doing this for a long time, but there's going to be a birth here, and I don't know, what was it, two or three years ago, all the planets came and lined up, and you had the same star of Bethlehem that happened back when Yeshua was born, and it all tells a story. There's a whole story there, okay? So the same kind of thing here. So it's telling us that there's going to be the birth of a child from a woman. Without a man, she would be what? A virgin. All right? So there's going to be the birth of a child, a virgin. Now remember, when he's saying this, he doesn't nail this down to Jewish people. Right now, Adam and Eve, their offspring is everybody. Everybody is part of their offspring. So let's go forward. Neither shall thy name anymore be called Abraham, but thy name shall or Abram. Thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee an exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So, that's a natural use of that word. Seed after you. In other words, when uh, Adam got to a certain point and he begets his third son, he said, he's yours, you've begotten him, it looks just like you, you know, all that's tied right up in the scriptures there. So for that to be used, that's a natural use of that. Well, you say, well then, was there any other place possibly that a seed of the woman is used? Well, there are a couple of places like that. So let, we'll take a look at those in just a second. Uh, God does say, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou may seed after uh, thee and the, their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you, and he that is, uh, help me out with that, eight, eight. Oh, eight days old, there we go, shall be circumcised among you every man child of your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is, not. what is that? Okay, you guys are good at this. Now, so circumcision. Have you ever wondered why God picked circumcision? I mean, when you when you think about it, hey, guys don't even like to cut the grass. You know what I'm talking about? We don't even like to mow the lawn. Let alone something like this. It's like you would really have to be over the top. You would really have to be somebody that would do anything for God. Later on, Abraham says, swear to me to his servant. He says, put your hand under my thigh. If you look up the word thigh, it's not his thigh. It's what we're talking about there. Why is that? Because that's the only commandment God had given him, and he couldn't think of anything higher to swear on than to swear on what he had done for God. Over the top. Believer. Matter of fact, Paul talks about it later on and he says well did Abraham did he was he a believer before his circumcision or after his circumcision and he said it was before but his belief was counted unto him for righteousness because he said I'm going to do this whatever 
And this is a weird guy because later on, you start looking at Abraham, he's ready to kill his son and offer him up as a sacrifice. That's over the top, especially for somebody from the Middle East. He that's born in that house and he that's bought with money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be with, uh, in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man and child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my commandment, or my covenant. Now, you notice in the New Testament, you'll find a place where it says that you were aliens, you were strangers, you were cut off from God, you were in the world without God. But now through the blood of Yeshua, or Jesus, you can partake in the covenants, plural, not just the new covenant. You ever notice a lot of folks will say, you know, the new covenant does away with all the other covenants. You say, well, do you ever worry that when it rains, you're going to be flooded, the whole world's going to be flooded? And they'll say, well, no. That covenant is still in place. Okay, well, what other covenants are in place? David, his lineage being on the throne, the Davidic covenant is still in place. You can pretty much say all of these things are still in place because there's a scripture that says God does not change. So he doesn't change things, but he fulfills things. Let me tell you how this all ends. Let me make this just real quick and we'll go to the ending of this. We're, we started out our great, 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 great grandparents started out in a garden. There was a river that ran through it. There was a tree of life. When it's all said and done, we will be in a garden. And a river will run through it, and there'll be a tree of life. God doesn't give up on a plan just because we may fall short of it. He's going to have things his way. Okay? So, let's go further. Now, Hagar is one of those people, if you notice here, and he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, camest thou, and whither art thou to go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. Okay. Now, is Hagar a virgin that's going to conceive no. Let's see. She may have been a virgin, but she's not going to you know, uh, conceive supernaturally. How do we know that? Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare to have no children. She had a handmaid, the Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. Now, we can account from wh where the seed comes from. We know where it comes from. This is not a supernatural event. All births are a supernatural event in some way. I understand that. But this is not a supernatural event. It's not the one talked of in Genesis 3.15. And they blessed Rebecca and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Rebecca is whose wife? <coughs> Isaac. Isaac. Isaac's wife, Rebecca. We can account for where the seed comes from. Okay. And say by myself, I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. I put, I make enemies between you, the serpent, and the believers. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. 
Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his, Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they both went up together. And Isaac spake unto Abram his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. <clears throat> and he said, Behold the wood and the fire. Hey, I see, Dad, I see the fire and I see the wood. But where's the lamp for the burnt offering? Isaac's a pretty smart guy, right? And Abraham says, My son, this is the most pivotal thing that a man says in the scriptures. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. If you really go through there and break this down, it's saying God will provide himself the lamb. He will be the lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So now we get another piece. Here's the sower that goes forth to sow. He's also the one that's going to redeem. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Let's see what the prophets say. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. What is this saying? A virgin's going to have a child. Now here's, here's the thing. The God's going to send you a sign. There's about three ways that you can break down virgin. One is a woman that has not been with a man. Two is a young maiden. Three is a woman of marrying age. If you said that a young woman of married age, she's married, young woman, had conceived, it would be like her and a thousand other people that day had conceived. So that's not a good sign. It's kind of like, you know, in China, if you're a one in a million, there's a thousand more just like you. Okay? So there's not a good sign. It's a mathematics joke. But it's not a good sign. Here you're wanting something that's going to stick out. So God says, I'm going to a virgin, someone that's never been with a man, shall conceive and bear a son, very specific, call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. She's going to birth God in the flesh, wrap him in the flesh of a human. Because who else could really pull off being perfect? Adam and Eve did for a little while, and then things didn't work out. So who could pull off being perfect? Only God himself. Let's see. Oh, and he's going to be sinless throughout his life. He knows how to refuse evil. Let's look. For unto us a child was born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, so we know that he's God in the flesh. Who is it? His name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Who's being born? The Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government of peace, there should be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it. And it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of Yehovah hosts will perform this. God is going to make this happen. Why? Because he said it back in Genesis 3.15. Isaiah picked up on that and then said he breaks it down a little bit more and gives us a little more of an insight. Wait, before we go any further, here's a, here's a question. It would be an expensive question. Are you ready? You'll get a piece of unleavened bread if you get this question right. I know, I know, we go to, we, we spare no expense here, okay? Who's the father of Jesus? Somebody? Who's the father of Jesus? Who? Oh, Joseph? Not Joseph, but Well, we'll get to it in a minute. Keep your thoughts, don't switch now, hang on, because I can't see you to tell if you switch. I, even I, am Yehovah, beside me there is no Savior. Whoa. That's kind of direct. Isaiah 43. 
Tell me and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Uh, help me out over there. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from what time? Have not I, Yehovah? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Isaiah 45, 21. And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. Now, this is kind of a good image. In other words, remember that part where it says, God is saying to Abraham, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. That's a really good Sunday school or Sabbath school lesson. Well, let me tell you, when you use this scripture, that does not go over very well with the three-year-old. Okay? I will feed them that oppose thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine, and all flesh shall what does it say? Yeah. know that I, Yehovah, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Hmm. A body hast thou prepared me. Hebrews 10, verse 5. A body hast thou prepared me. That's New Testament for those of you that are keeping, are keeping score. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast, <clears throat> excuse me, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua, or Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. In other words, he's going to be the Messiah or the Christ. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there is no end. And Mary uh, said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Da -da, she's a virgin. The sign was for a virgin. The woman that had not been with a man. The young girl had not been with a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also this holy thing which shall stand or shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So the Father of Yeshua is the Holy Ghost. So the okay, that's another, that's another thing. But anyway, if you got that, time we'll give you a piece of leather. And if you got any questions about this, I know we're going fast, but we'll get to the end of this quickly, and then if you got questions coming, I'll be glad to answer if I can. This is just straight scripture, pretty much. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on his wise. When his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together. That's another thing saying she was a virgin. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Who do you think in the scriptures, ladies, had the most faith? Joseph, you're engaged, you put yourself in this position. You're engaged to Joseph. All of a sudden, you become pregnant. You, but he says, who did this? And you say, God. That's a lot of faith. Then Joseph, her husband, being just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, 
Joseph, thou son of David, in other words, he is from the line of David also, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, the word ghost comes from the German word geist, which means disembodied spirit. That's why they've changed, really, the more modern text to spirit, Holy Spirit. Okay? And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, which in Hebrew would be more like Yeshua, which means Yah has become our salvation. Uh, for he shall save his, sin, his people from their sins. Who's the only Savior? Yah. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. When Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took to him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth their firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Thou hast prepared a body for me. And behold, two of them went out the same day. We're almost done. And behold, two of them went out the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together the things which had happened. They're bummed because crucifixion has happened. Now they heard that Jesus rose from the dead with a couple of ladies. We don't know. We didn't see it ourselves. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Yeshua drew near. Yeshua himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one with another? In modern English that would be, hey, what's up? Why are you guys so sad? As you walk and are so sad, and the one of them whose name was, was it Cleophas? Answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass here these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be uh, condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of the company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. And certain of them, who were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered those things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, in other words, the Torah, the first five books, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went. And he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is too long. It is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he said at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Same thing he did at the Passover meal. How do we know he ate Passover? Because he said it like ten times. Yeah. I desire to go and eat the Passover with you. I desire to go eat the Passover. Can you get us a place to eat the Passover? Can you go over and get a place to eat the Passover? Can you do this? Do Passover, 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 Passover. How do we know he meant the Passover? Because he's really a smart guy. He's like God in the flesh. 
He knows what he means. I know that the next day he had to be available to be hung on the cross at the same time the Passover lamb was slain. I don't understand all that, but I know that I trust in him. And if he said it that many times, he meant it. And then again in 1 Corinthians, he said, look, when you take the bread, do that in remembrance of me. When you take the cup, do that in remembrance of me until I come again. Paul, the apostle, said, 1 Corinthians, I think Jake covered that. He said, keep the feast. And he was specifically talking about Passover. Why? Because the lamb that was slain at Passover by the directions of God is the same lamb that is slain and crucified later in a different form. You're slaying something that it says the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. If you look at it all together, it means forever. In other words, every time you sin, you got to go slay a bullock or a lamb or a goat or something. But with, let's see. For the law, having shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. For then, in other words, if you slay a lamb, and you sin again on your way home, you gotta grab another lamb and go back. If you sin and you call on forgiveness on Yeshua, that forgiveness is granted. If you happen to make a bad mistake and sin again that same day, you can plead the blood again. You can repent or back away from that sin and quit doing it Ask God to forgive you, and he'll forgive you again with the same sacrifice. Why? Because God doesn't change. If he has sacrificed for you once, it's for all eternity. That's why at the end, well, we'll get to the end in a minute. Um, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no conscience of sin, or sins, but in those sacrifices there's a remembrance again, made of sins every year. In other words, this is cyclical. This is to remind us. When we do Passover, it's to remind us. Getting the leaven or the sin out of our houses, it's to remind us how easy it is for sin to get into our lives. There's a reason for it. If you quit talking about it, a lot of times you forget it. Those that are never taught history, are destined to repeat it. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, he that cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. To do thy will, O God. Above them he saith, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Why is it a better covenant? Because the first covenant was written on stone. And if you wanted to see it, if you could get in and see it, it'd be in Jerusalem, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Now, it's written on your heart. Before, you had to take a lamb to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be slain. Now, if you make a mistake, get cut off in traffic on the way home, maybe say a whoop, 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 you can ask for forgiveness right where you are. It's better covenant. 
And every priest standeth daily ministering and offer oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Who are the enemies? Interesting that it mentions Hagar earlier. Hagar's the mother eventually of Twelve princes. Jacob is the father of twelve princes. Very interesting setup. One believes that, well, we won't go into all that. Okay, let's get back here. For by one offering have perfected forever them that are sanctified, not just everybody, but those that are set apart unto God. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said, or excuse me, after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. In other words, there you don't have to offer for sin anymore. It has been done. You ask God for forgiveness through the blood of Jesus or Yeshua. Yeshua meaning God who has become our salvation. Everything in the Word is about God. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Then the Word, in verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. God himself was the one who had to walk among us. He himself was... Now, I, let me tell you. John Calvin said some amazing things. John Calvin's understanding of the total deprivation of man is bogus. You do not have to sin. If you, if you were totally depraved, you would be in here beating each other to death and all the types of carnage and everything going on right now. You couldn't keep yourself from it. God in Deuteronomy, after the commandments was read, he said, these are not too hard for you. He knows us. That was after the fall. He told Cain, he said, look, you know, why are you looking so sad? If you'll just offer correctly, then everything's okay. But if you choose not to, then sin waits for you at the door. But you can rule over it. Cain didn't have the Holy Ghost. Cain didn't have anything. He didn't have the blood of Yeshua. And God says, why could, Cain, why could Cain have ruled over sin? Because he was made in the image of God. The guy who was there in the tombs, cutting himself constantly, had a legion of devils. A legion, probably 5,000, 6,000 devils, 8,000. Let's say it's 8,000 to make it easy. That would be 2,000 on your right arm, 2,000 on your left arm, 2,000 on your right leg, 2,000 on your left leg. But it says he ran to Jesus, to Yeshua, and fell down in front of him and worshipped. He wasn't saved. He wasn't filled with God's spirit. He was filled with 8,000 other spirits. But he had the ability to run up to God, to fall down in front of him, and to worship. Amen. Because the same God that spoke Genesis 1-1 was the same God that speaks the last word in Revelation. I'm the first and the last. Beside me there is no other. He's all-powerful and he never changes. And if he's ever offered us salvation, he's as a lamb 
as a person, however he offered it, he still offers it to us today. And whether you have his spirit or not, because you're in his image, you can overcome anything that's in this world that's standing between you and him. And you can go back tonight and say, I want to live for you. I want what you want for my life. Amen.